thank you very much for this opportunity to present our work. Um, so, in our line of work, we always start with some biological samples, we process them, and in the end, we want to gain some biological insights, and um, I guess for the majority of us, also some nice publication. Um, Within the scope of this project and also in the recent years, we've seen um, significant advances in um, single-cell multiomics. We are now able to sequence um, a gigantic and growing number of um, single cells in solution, and we are adding a whole new dimension of information um, with uh, new spatial approaches. This morning we heard a bit from BD about um, additional data sources and we saw a lot about imaging. So what we can see is, uh, say is um, that we have a growing um, amount of data that we need to process. And this affects um, this um, black box of bioinformatics um, that is becoming our new bottleneck. So the new data um, is really a challenge, and we can take a look into this black box. So um, once we get our digital data, we have two major tasks to do. The pre-processing, where we try to reduce our data set to something smaller, and then the analysis um, to gain our biological insights. For this, um, we have plenty of tools available. Um, so we heard a lot about analysis this morning already, but um, also for pre-processing. We can run many different strategies, and um, it is actually a combination of many different tools that we are using there. And all these tools exchange their data um, through files. And this is becoming more and more inefficient when we think of larger data sets. Let me show you a small example. Recently, in our group, we ran a SegWell experiment um, with a few thousand cells, and we had um, 48 gigabytes of data resulting from it. After pre-processing, we had a total of 80, but in the middle, during the pre-processing, there was a total of 800 gigabytes read and written, so this is vastly inefficient, and it's going to be a major problem with growing data sets. So remember, those were only a few thousand sales, uh, uh, cells, um, but we are also going into um, data sets where we want to look at millions of cells. So this is a challenge. Traditionally, this um, challenge has been approached by just buying more computers and connect them in a network environment. Um, however, this is a problem that not only is um, known to life sciences, but also to other domains. And therefore, the people at Hewlett Packard Enterprise um, decided, okay, we need to look at this, and they proposed a new architecture called memory-driven computing. The idea is to go away from traditional compute-centric clusters to um, a memory-centric system that is a modular solution of um, different components. These components fall into multiple categories. They can be processors, they can be memory, and they can be accelerators. These are the main classes that we're currently seeing, and they are all connected by a fabric called Gen Z, um, based on an open standard. So the design that it is based on is um, designed to be future-proof. So here, just a few numbers to show you this. Um, I'm not sure, um, maybe a quick raise of hands, um, who knows what a yottabyte is? So 4,096 yottabytes um, that can be addressed within um, such a system, that is um, 250,000 times the amount of data um, that has been generated by humanity until this point. So there's still some room for growing. Um, a total of 60 million devices can be connected, and if we would connect um, just processing power, um, this would actually be the equivalent of um, 1,600 um, exascale computers. So how can we use that for our um, bioinformatics applications? Well, we can take a look at the two major categories. So if I want to do a pre-processing, um, I might want to say I use a pipeline based on SnakeMake um, that uses Callisto, and I know from previous experiences um, this exploits in particular processors, and I store my results at a certain position in memory. I can then continue um, with my pre-processed data and say I want to analyze it, and therefore um, I can say I use um, ScanPy. ScanPy makes um, use of GPUs, and as you can see um, by the frame and the memory, um, it uses the same memory location, so um, we avoid um, additional data transfers to make the overall system more efficient. One um, one way to gain from this is just to keep your data in memory. This already gives you some nice results. But once you embrace this new architecture, you can um, actually get um, even bigger, oh, 
even more results. So um, we have one small example um, where we took Callisto, a near-optimal RNA-seq quantification tool, and we accelerated it um, by two orders of magnitude. And um, in this context, more importantly, we were able to reduce the energy consumption by 60%. And if you want to learn more about that, um, I want to invite you to poster number five, where we show some more details on this work. So what's the outlook? Um, how can we um, use memory-driven computing in the future? So far, pre-processing is a one-time task. You do it, and then you're happy you're done with it, but you don't go back. But imagine if you could go back um, to your cohort study and um, apply a new reference genome. Or you can go ahead and say, um, in my filtering, um, I've always excluded mitochondrial genes. Um, however, they might carry some information um, that we haven't seen before. We can also use it in analysis to exploit the abundance of memory um, to load and um, deal with larger single-cell data sets. And from a technical perspective, um, since we have this underlying fabric, um, we can just extend the system with additional resources once our data sets become larger. So our system grows, but our software doesn't have to adapt to that. And finally, um, with the accelerators, we have the possibility um, to add future technologies once they become available. Think about quantum computing, for example. This, what I've shown you, is a collaborative effort um, between the DZNE, the University of Bonn, and um, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Do we have questions for Matthias? I actually do have one. So it sounds very promising, and, and I guess I'm, I'm a biologist, so forgive me. But I guess you buy one, one of such machines with all these components, and you can adapt the, your, you basically code this, the components to work with your data, which has some specific needs. But how much do you think cost? Well, you Are these start... new architectures very expensive compared to classical architectures? So the first components for this fabric, I think, will be out later this year. Um, so I'm not aware of the prices, of course. Um, but um, with this architecture, you can actually start with something small and then extend the system based on your needs. Um, so you have the control over that. Thank you.